So, you know, one of the fundamental things I tell my students is that when you're doing research, think about if the New York Times wrote an article about you, you never know when they might, but if they did, what would the headlines be? And that forces them to think about big, impactful ways to express and shape their research. Uh, another thing I tell them is, you know, you never know, you might do a startup company. If you did, what would the business case be? And that focuses them on research that is pertinent, immediate, direct, and has value that they can explain to a venture capitalist or to their husband or wife or you know girlfriend and it focuses the thinking on simple concepts not uh, diffuse thoughts. I think that if you were to summarize my work it would be I try and take the real world and create virtual copies of it so that you can operate in the virtual world about your real world. So for example there's inventory in this room wouldn't it be great if you wanted to know if the camera was already in this room? RFID enables you to kind of view this room and see if your inventory is here. Uh, and in fact, all my research is in that space of creating copies in the cloud of the real world. You know, uh, retail, when you go into a Walmart store or a Target store, it's like a war room. It's like, in fact, it's like Iraq. It's like our soldiers in Iraq. It's fog. They... Uh, Things are happening, materials moving around, customers are moving things. You have hundreds of employees moving stuff back and forth. It is very difficult for these companies to keep track of their inventory. The, the downside is a consumer walks in wanting to buy something and it isn't there. What RFID does in retail and in the supply chain in general is it gives you visibility through the fog. So for the first time, you have a map of things as they're moving. So you can figure out precisely where your inventory is, whether you need to replenish, whether it's too old, whether it's outdated, and it improves uh, customer satisfaction, safety, sustainability, and frankly, the bottom line. Look, I mean, the thing about these RFID tags is that the range is a few meters if you have this equipment, which is very expensive. So the idea is that consumers have choice. Um, the, they can remove, they can disable the tag, um, and it isn't possible to read these tags through the walls of your house or from a satellite or something like that. So in fact, uh, RFID theoretically stops at checkout, but you might want to choose, uh, you might choose to keep it on because you might want to track your own inventory. You know, you might keep losing socks and you might want to track them in your house. So does it actually stop? That's your choice. But it could stop there if you wanted it to. RFID is essentially a way to see the tag with a reader, even if you can't visually see it. So it's kind of like I could close my eyes and just sense all the stuff in this room that has a tag on it. It might be behind that partition there, but I can still sense it within a certain range, within a few meters. What it lets you do is automatically count things. It's as mundane and banal as that. But that's a very profound thing. That's how we manage our stuff. And there's a lot of stuff out there. And companies' uh, fates depend on whether or not they manage their stuff well. Uh, and that's what RFID enables companies to do in the supply chain. RFID certainly has a role in sensible cities. Wherever inventory is moved, RFID has a role. Um, you have vehicles in a city. You have inventory. You might have you know, uh, tables in a, in a conference hall, you may have uh, equipment that's moved in and out. RFID lets you keep track of it. Especially today, cities are struggling for money. And the last thing they want to do is waste resources. Um, hospitals are struggling for funds. Did you know that in hospitals, equipment like an ultrasound machine, it is, uh, equipment gets misplaced or uh, is difficult to find uh, a, a surprising number of times. And in fact, if you could track inventory, you could keep your assets, asset numbers much lower and you can have the same efficiency with much fewer uh, pieces of equipment. So in fact RFID has a very fundamental role in any agency that delivers services to citizens. You know it's very ironic when we launched RFID our first target was tags, make them really cheap and we got there. The next target was readers, make them really really cheap and we got there. But the thing we forgot was it's not a cost of the readers, it's a cost of installing those readers. Because you need wiring, you need ethernet, or you need dead ethernet, I'll come back to that. You need to install servers, 
You need to install software. You need someone to go tweak stuff. It's all the other stuff that we don't think of in the high-tech world that really made RFID initially expensive. But that's all about to change. The reason it's about to change is, in the 1990s, when we launched this industry, we needed Ethernet. Who uses landlines anymore? This is the world of wireless. Not even Wi-Fi, but the Kindle, which goes straight into the cloud. Who needs servers in your uh, facilities anymore? There is this thing called the cloud. So there's a whole new generation of RFID about to happen. It's a, uh, a, a device-level RFID where you get a reader, you plug it in, and you enable it in the cloud, and you're good to go. Um, so yes, inst installation costs were high, but thank heavens for technology, because today I think that we're on the threshold of a very seamless world of RFID. It used to be that uh, if you wanted to do some computing, you bought 10 computers and you put them at headquarters and you plug this massive ethernet cable to it and data went into it and if you had a power outage you couldn't access the data and if you had a flood you lost the data. The world has changed a lot. What happens now is that there are companies like Amazon which already have thousands of computers or Google and they are in this really safe place. They are powered with hydroelectric power they, are, uh, they have massive data connections and they're on the internet. And the internet is much faster now. So what that means is that you don't need to buy a computer and install it in your headquarters, even frankly in your own home. What you can do is do everything with those computers that Amazon or Google provides to you. And the response time is very fast because you have very fast internet. And this is leading to a whole revolution in the way in which we interact with computing. Uh, as consumers, we see it in the form of the Kindle or the iPad or the iPhone. We store our files on Dropbox, say. This is collectively referred to as the cloud. You could argue that uh, we are uh, in between explosions of deployment. Uh, there are all the thousands of RFID deployments around the world. There are probably uh, about two billion RFID tags with our standards on them were uh, made last year. Um, but I think we're on the threshold of a next level of uh, up-ramp uh, because now RFID is going to be so easy to install that it needn't be the Walmarts of the world, it could be the mom and pop shop, right, that installs um, RFID or maybe a university installs RFID to keep track of uh, its chairs in a conference room. So yeah, I think that we're on the threshold of a whole new level of adoption. The internet went through similar cycles. It went up, and then it went up, and then it went up. And RFID is in the, is in the beginnings of that. The great thing about being at MIT is that grand visions um, sometimes walk the line between grand and uh, lunatic. And uh, MIT has such a long history of delivering big things to the world that you can really push that boundary. It's hard to get close to that boundary when you're at an institution which doesn't have the same reputation. You don't have the same safety net. You don't have the same aggression. But we can go close to that edge. And industries, because of our reputation, will follow us. So we're able to make leaps, to take this analogy further, that most others aren't. Could I have launched this industry with my colleagues uh, if we were at a different institution? Probably not. Uh, but because of our great industrial connections and because of our reputation, we can walk close to that edge and sometimes beyond. So uh, cities today, as you know, a lot of them are strapped for cash, yet they're growing, especially in the developing world. You have thousands of people moving in and you need to provide services to these millions and millions of people that are moving into cities every day. Um, how do you provide these services? And uh, over, the, over the course of the last few days, you've heard from other professors who've talked about sensible cities. One of the things that really uh, uh, excites me is the concept of crowdsourced city information. And I use the word crowdsourced uh, somewhat liberally. Take, for example, traffic uh, lights and street lights. Well, let's say there's a street light that's broken on a, in a, on a street in Cambridge. How do you actually, how does a city know? Well, what they do is they send people around to inspect them, and you know, that happens occasionally. If the light is out, it might be broken for weeks, months, maybe a year before someone notices. Maybe there's more crime there as a result, and so on. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just stick a camera facing up 
on every cop car. And as the cars ply the city, they provide semi-real-time information about which street lights are working and which are not. It's such a simple concept. And that's what we're doing. So for example, we have a project where we put cameras and light sensors on city vehicles. And we're doing this in the UK and in Spain, where uh, with our sponsor Ferrovial, we're looking at uh, street light intensities and monitoring street light conditions. Another project we have is we use um, thermal imaging to see which buildings are leaking heat. And we use that to uh, uh, permit or enable the building owner to take uh, measures to fix these problems. And I think there's a, just a fascinating array of these technologies just waiting. You can have citizens self-report, for example, there's a number of projects like that, where you have an app, you just take a picture of something, you send it in, and uh, the city automatically digests that piece of information, and out comes a report that says, you know, that particular road has a, a, uh, a pothole in it. So uh, this area of city scanning, crowdsourcing, or citizen-reported um, city infrastructure monitoring, I believe is going to make cities more efficient, safer, uh, and uh, frankly more cost efficient.